Hello everyone and welcome to yet another episode of the Daily Medieval Podcast and today we are starting our new mini-series on House of the Dragon. Now I'm joined here today with a very special guest and dear friend uh, Ben who is our resident Game of Thrones expert. How are you doing Ben? I'm doing good, thank you Luke. So, self-proclaimed Game of Thrones expert, Yeah. tell us more. Well... I've, uh, I've read each one of the main story uh, books at least six times, Whew. as well as um, the three short stories based on the Targaryen family, the three short stories based on the um, Hedge Knight, and the two history books currently written about Game of Thrones at least multiple Whew. times as well. Christ. As well as every theory you could think of. Oh my gosh. So... Your authority is solid. Yes, yes, it is. So, episode one, the pilot, came out, when was it? 22nd? Something like that? Last Sunday. What did you think? I think they generally did it pretty well. Yeah? It had that Game of Thrones feeling. Yeah. Uh, Certain parts of it did feel a bit cheap. Not sure if you got that vibe. Interesting. But it is a pilot. True. So it might clear itself out a bit more later on. Um, and then generally the story was a lot more sh- shortened in time span right? than it originally was but I could see why they'd want to do that for TV in what way do you mean? Uh, things happen closer people are aged up Got yeah. um, like competitive well, we books can, we can do that in a later section oh, right, yeah. as, a, as a comparison so what happened this episode Luke? so the episode <clears throat> it starts off with a good old succession crisis, which, if uh, any medieval historian out there knows, is uh, absolutely mental. And uh, you can see more about succession crises and uh, in pre- in one of my previous episodes. But there's a succession crisis, and essentially... Link in the description. Yep. Who gets it? The series the first. The series the first. So we cut to then... Uh, what is it, the, something like the seventh year of his reign? Something yeah. like that, wasn't it? Um, and we have a, a, a new heir, because anyone knows that um, as a monarch, your top priority, in a way, not only is the stability and defence of the nation, but having an heir, a son, that can take over and reduce the chance of getting a succession of crisis. Yeah, and then we are introduced to his oldest child, mm. Rhaenyra's, um, as she flies it on Dragonback, as well as a lot of other characters, such as uh, uh, the the Hand of the King's daughter, Alyssa Hightower, uh, the Hand of the King later on, uh, his council, um, which is Lyrie Lyle- Strong, um, Lord Beesbury, his grandmates do, I can't think of right now, uh, his brother, Damon Targaryen, who is his massive city watch. Yeah. And um, we are we don't we we haven't really, we don't know who his they haven't introduced us to the head of his king's guard. I think okay. it's the old man standing in the background, not the hang one hanging out with Nera. Okay, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. As well as a few of the characters are introduced, such as Christian Cole, who will take a big he's a big plot line in the future of the season. He's uh he's the main antagonist to Nera as we'll go mm. on. But will we see that? Well, we don't know. Who knows? Who knows? Um. So then we get a. Uh, we could just get introductions to people, introduction to the high towers, introduction to the council at that time, mm. introduction to the realm with lots of little scenic things, the things you may have seen before, <laughs> um, including that one tower where the mountain and the hound had their fight. Of course, of course. Um, and then we get a tournament. Oh, a dear we'll old get, we'll, tournament. We'll go, we'll, Which we'll go more to later. We'll get on to. And then, obviously, the funeral of um, the king's wife, Emma yes. Aaron, uh, and his daughter, who I think, or his son, who I mm. think is called Balon. Um, he has, he has, but uh, he's had a few miscarriages by then. Uh, and then uh, the banishment of his brother Damon. Yes. To to the uh, to the to the veil. Uh, but yeah, there's a, there's a few things just before we get into any of our little details that mm. I wasn't a fan of. Okay. And, and we'll get Here your opinion go. on it. Go for it. What is the point? Of the little rocks for the small council. Did you even notice it? I did notice that. Which I thought was interesting. Almost like... 
saying that they're there. Yeah, but we can see they're not there or not, and we know who yeah. they are. Yeah, I would, I'd be interested to know. Is that something that's in the books? No, nope, I've never heard of it so, before. <laughs> so an executive decision. Yeah, yeah, to add these little pebbles yeah, to block it. I I just think that it was wasn't a thing in the main show. Yeah. Odd. Um, there's also... I do like the look of the iPhone. Even the iPhone looks a bit yeah. more impressive now. Mm. But it does make the hole look smaller. That is true, yeah. Does it take away from... By adding all those other swords? Because obviously the Iron Throne, it was this this massive, this massive, beautiful throne of, of swords melted well, down and everything. Whereas now it's kind of really scattered about. And yeah. it's almost hidden. So I don't know which and one it do you prefer. Work, it doesn't work in, in the book. It's like more of like a, a, a one and a half, two story yeah. throne. Like where he has to walk up the steps made of swords. Mm. But obviously there's limitations. So obviously they wanted to imply that it was a bit more than... Yeah. Um, because they have all the lines in the, in the previous series of like, oh, it's meant to be a thousand swords, it's meant to be a hundred thousand swords, whatever they say, yeah, yeah, yeah. changes it a bit. And it's like, I could barely count like... <laughs> About like, 20. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there's lots of that. Yeah. But I think it works. And I knew, I do know they use they use the biggest sound stage in Europe for the throne. Oh, wow. So they are limited, and there yeah. is limitations to TV, which obviously in books you can grow to anything. Yeah. You could say, why not just use an actual castle or something? But hard to come by. Yeah. Would have been charged out the ass for it. Yeah, true. Um, another little thing. Don't like the mentions to Game of Thrones so much. I'm actually not a fan of it. See, I am. I, I, I do love a good kind of, not nostalgia, but kind of a good, a good reference. No. So I quite liked it. But it, like, it's just, why are they referencing to future events in the world? It doesn't make sense in the world. I guess, I guess. Like that prophecy, the, the Song of Ice and Fire prophecy, yeah. there needs to be a Huggyang on the throne. Not mentioned by the Targaryens previously. Later Targaryens, mm. yes, it is start to be mentioned. Right. Not that early of Targaryens. Got yeah. Got the whole Aegon wasn't just a conqueror, he also thought he was trying to save the world thing. Mm. Is a little bit, I don't know, pandering. Was the whole anti anti conquest movement we seem to be having at the moment? That's fair. That's fair. Um, yeah. And then the dagger that the dagger, Arya uses to kill, kill the. Uh, why is this random king carrying it? <laughs> now you obviously know a bit more about it, but I thought it was quite prominent, like royal dagger. No. Aye. In, in in the books. It's a random dagger. It is Valerian steel with the yeah. dragon bone hilt, but there is a lot more Valerian steel daggers than ah. swords. Um, it wasn't owned by the Targaryens at any point that we know of. Okay. It was given to Robert Baratheon in his, I want to say, one of his name day tournaments, or either that or when Joffrey was born. Oh, okay. Um, Interesting. And it's, it's just mentioned in the books... As a, uh, as Robert likes to carry around a big cart full of half of his armory in it when he goes mm. up north, he's got like a bunch of his swords, a bunch of his daggers, and Joffrey just happened to take that dagger. Ah, that's interesting. So it's not it's not a particularly prominent dagger. Otherwise, yeah. it would have been noticed it was missing. But off. do you think then that they've just sprinkled that in, or do you think that dagger will now have prominence? Because there's always a thing in like TV and film that you show things on purpose. You don't just show yeah, it. Yeah, if you show... It, it, you what's know. it called? Something's pistol, isn't it? Yeah. If you, show, if you show a gun, it has to be shot by exactly. the third act. If you show a gun in the first act. So will that dagger return, do you think? No. Will it? No? Do that you think they're just sprinkling it in as an Easter egg? Well, like, why would it? Because there are, there's already two very prominent weapons mm. in this time in history that which are known to be Targaryen, mm. which is um, Blackfire, wielded by the king, at yeah. the moment, the series, and that will go on, be a lot more impactful if we go later into the series. I don't know how how far that I've not really looked researched too much into how far the series is planning on going, whether they're just going to do this certain part first, and then ne next season we'll get more of the Dance of the Dragons, mm. um, or, or and then the other one is Dark Sister, in which is um, Damon's sword. Got you. Yeah, they're the two prominent weapons in the Targaryen family. The first one, uh, Blackfire, was used by Aegon, the Conqueror, the first. And Dark Sister was used by his warrior sister, his older sister, Visenya, 
Um, and then his younger sister didn't have a didn't have a sword. Oh, I see. I see. But um, yeah, so that, that's the prominent thing. So we've gone through. The series. Yeah. Right. So we... yeah, how did it? How do you think this then compares to the books? What? So in our section in the books. Moving on to our section in the books. 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 Um, well, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, a lot of it is cramped in time. So by the time that um, the Great Council happens and uh, the series is uh, designated heir, mm. Jahiris has already had, he'd had 14 children, if I remember correctly. Um, and the series is his second son's oldest son and the queen that never was when uh, when, uh, when Ares yeah. is his first son's oldest daughter mm. so that's that's the whole question of who gets it there was other people there was some bastards of one of his daughters Sarah who was a whore uh, she ran away and became a whore there was his other son who was a maester an arch maester at the citadel uh, but he refused it yeah they he did have, um, he obviously he had more daughters, but his um, his oldest son married a Baratheon, who was also half, uh, was also his sister half sister. Mm. So um, his oldest son, Baylor, no Baylor was the series father. Um, Aegon, I want to say, uh, was married to Jaehaerys's half sister's son. Got you. Um, and then his second oldest son, as we all know, the Targaryens was married to his sister, who died in childbirth. So he'd lost pretty much all of his like children and died before he mm. he had gone. Uh, one of them married the Aerons, who then becomes and have one daughter, but died but dies in childbirth. That daughter becomes the series' wife, Emma. Got you. Got you. Uh, so she's also half Targaryen as well. Yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, so there's a there's a massive complex in that. So this, the series ends up getting chosen. It, by this time, he'd already had his daughter Rhaenyra's. Mm. Um, she was about four or five, and he'd already kind of started grooming her for rule, which we don't see in the show. Okay. In the show, it's like, oh, I'm now your heir. Yeah. But they they get a bit mi- mixed up because she's still got him as a cupbearer. Right. And in the in the book, he has a, has her as a cupbearer from a young age. Yeah. So she can learn. I see. That's why she's in the small council. Because obviously, in the episode, there's a big thing about rem- like breaking tradition and having a female ruler. Now, in kind of I guess Targaryen history, is that a thing then that you kind of see so, that there are female rulers or there's strong female queens. Yeah. But they are never rulers and outright. Right. Okay. So Jahiri's his wife was a very strong queen who got mm. very annoyed at him for not having a female heir. Right. Again, for the sister. Uh, his father was. He had an older sister as well who wanted to be queen. Yeah. Another Rhaenyra. <laughs> There's like four <laughs> of them. It gets. As in real history, yeah. they like repeating names. Uh, she kind of ends up holding her own court. Um, first in the Westerlands on uh, Far Island, and then uh, then in uh, oh, what's it called again? The Big Castle, um, Harrenhal. She has her own little court in Harrenhal, mm. which is seen as a threat sometimes, and he has to go and deal with her. But it's never really a major issue. Go ahead. Before that, he had obviously Aegon's sister Visenya who's also his wife, she's a very strong um, impact on the world. She creates yeah. the King's Guard, oh, wow. creates the Dragon Guard. Um, yeah. And we've already seen a bit of madness in it from Mago, who's Visenya's son, mm. who uh, divided the faith with the, uh, with the crown and destroyed the faith militant, who we then see pop up later on in Game of Thrones. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there isn't, there's no female rulers outright. Mm. As kings of the Seven Kingdoms. Yeah. But you've got to remember, the Seven Kingdoms has only been around for about 120 years as ah, a united entity. Yeah. We do see kings and queens, we do see queens in some of the other kingdoms. Got you. Very rarely, mm. but we do see them. Uh, okay. The Starks are quite prominent for having strong female leaders. Um, 
And then so are the Aarons, mm. and so are the Dornish, obviously. Oh, yeah. But the Dornish oh. at this point in time are not part of the Seven Kingdoms. That happens about six years later in the books. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so a lot of things happen a lot quicker. Mm. Viserys' wife, Emma, dies a lot earlier in the books. She dies when oh. Renee is about 12, not when she's about 16, 17, which I assume yeah. she, she's aged by the moment. Yeah. Um, so she, he'd already not hoped for an heir for a while. Mm. Um, and then the Hightower girl was actually around during Jahiri's time oh. and kind of looked after Jahiri's in his old age. Yeah. And then just as um, the series becomes king is when his wife dies. I see. Very early on. Mm. And then he kind of liked her because of the whole, his grand, looking after his granddad. Mm. And then he marries her. So the Hightower girl who's currently friends with Rhaenyra's in the books at this time, is already married to her father and already had children. Oh, wow. Yes. Interesting. And by this point as well, I think, it, it, obviously the age of the characters. Yeah. yeah. If, if Renee is about 17, 18, she's already, she'd already married as well. Oh. She's married to uh, the Valerian son. Right. The uh, the character we see is Corey's Valerian, you know, the, the shipwright, the... Yeah. The... the the master of ships, mm. um, his son. You see, you do see his two children, his daughter and wife, his, da- his daughter and his son, and his wife, the queen he never was. And yeah, so and then I think she'd have had her first son by now. She'd already made her relationship with Kristen Cole, um, and other things. I won't say any more because that will come out later in the show. <laughs> I'm assuming. Uh, so yeah, it's just time span is a lot more yeah. squished in. Do you think? Is. Do you think they'll keep quite closely? To the books, or do you think they'll stray a bit? I think they'll keep keep to the main plot. Yeah, but they might. Move. Do you think the backlash of Game things of Thrones? What? Because I know that in Game of Thrones they strayed after the season four. See, season or four is the last one. True base of the book, but there's yeah. some storylines that carry on to season five. So do you think because of the backlash of that, they're like, we've got to keep? Well, they books. have the whole story for this one. True, which is quite nice. Yeah, so they have the whole story, but yeah, so. Yeah. This, but what we saw in this episode was basically an introduction, and I think what we're going to see in the next few episodes is the build up to the Dance of Dragons, Got you. which is the Targaryen Civil War. I see, right. Um, which we're going to see. I, I don't know. Who? Who? Let's let's. Let, I want to answer the question now. But who do you think would pick sides? Who do you do you know who the two sides are? Hmm. I would reckon that it would be. The this is where I get all the names wrong. Damon, is yeah, it, right on one side, kind of vying for power, vying for the throne, versus then what's the girl called? Rhaenyra. Rhaenyra. That would be that's the obvious. What you, that's what you guess, isn't it? That's would that would be the obvious. Okay. Uh, from the look of it, he's just been banished. She's just been uh, kind of not crowned, but like you know. Well, I'm just gonna say before we see the dance, the war of the dance of the dragons, we're gonna see a different war first. Okay. Which is the War of the Steps episodes, but we'll talk about that later episodes as we're building into it. Yeah. We got a little hint. Yeah. In the show, to, in the last episode. Yeah. Yeah. Corey's did a little hint to it with the triumphant. Okay. Yeah, but we'll see more of that. All right. Yeah, I'm trying to think of anything else that's slightly different in the books. Yeah. Beside time differences, um, the family trees are pretty on point. Uh, there is a, a couple more Targaryen relatives kind of they again they hint to the baratheon being a relative to targaryens mm. they are they're at this point so um Rhaenyra's, his mother was a baratheon the queen that never was yeah um who herself was half targaryen so uh i think it's her it's her uncle okay yeah. who is the current baratheon lord her uncle or yeah her, her, um, her cousin so we see that as yeah. the, as for the thing so he is related to the crown as well. The Aarons aren't anymore. The only Aaron Targaryen is the one that's married to Viserys. Got you. Um, the Valerians, Corey, Corey's, his mother was actually um, was actually another. I don't know his his yeah his mother was another um, Targaryen, and it's just 
he, that that's a very closely linked exactly. family to the Targaryens. Yeah. But yeah, we don't we don't see, it's not a it's not a massive royal family at the moment. Even though the generation before mm. had had loads of children. Yeah. And not many of them had survived through. Um, Interesting. But yeah, so as it says, we're gonna. It says there's ten dragons alive at this point in history. Oh wow! Uh, and I'm wondering which dragon it's going to be. So we're going on to our, our, our nature part of this, our, our dragon watch. <laughs> so so far, we've seen Caraxes, the the blood the blood red or the blood red or whatever, yeah. who is David's uh, um, dragon, and Silaxis or Cy- 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 dragon, the golden yeah. dragon. So Caraxes is. I want to say the second, third oldest dragon living at this time. Okay. The oldest we've seen so far. I don't know which dragons they're going to show us. Viserys' dragon has already died. Yeah. Vagar. Mm. Um, he was the dragon of the Senya and the um, one of the oldest dragons left. In, no, not Vagar. Valerian the Black Dread he, he rode. Mm. Uh, who was the only dragon to see the downfall of the Valyrian Empire. Um, so he's died. Died of old age. There's a bunch of stuff with him. Um, that's really interesting. Uh, and then, so the dragons that we know are, that um, we know alive from the books is a lot more. Mm. So there's two Valerian children. Okay. Have dragons. Ooh. Yeah. Um, and as well as, obviously, Valeria and Damon are the only ones we've seen so far. Yeah. I do like the fact they've made the dragons look quite a bit different. I was going to ask you that. I was going to say, how... So the dragons compared to the ones in Game of Thrones? It, it, well, they're more identifi- identifying. And yeah. we're going to see dragon on dragon fight, so I think you're going to need that. Yeah, different, the different colours Rather especially. than just different colours, same model. Mm. What you saw Caraxes with a very long neck. Yeah. You saw wings on his back feet. A bit more Chinese-esque dragon. Yeah, I, I, I noticed the wings on the back feet And you well. may think, like, biologically, they, they're all, like, related, they can't look so different, but they're magical creatures. There's a certain amount of yeah. leeway you give it. In terms of, kind of, strength, power, size, how do those compare to Daenerys' dragons? They age a lot slower in the books. Oh, okay. So, say, Daenerys, what, her dragons are... Five, six by the end of the show? Yeah. Five or six years old? Mm. And they're already huge? Yeah, yeah. In in the books, there's a big thing with um, people giving eggs to newborn Targaryens and their new hatchling forming. Mm. Some some Targaryens will ride old dragons, but some of them also have their own hatchlings. Got you. And they're not really able to fly with a person on their back until they're about, like, 12. Oh, wow. And then they're still... So it can take to, a whole lifetime. They age well with a child. Mm. So, like, as the child gets bigger, they can just about fly with the, the kid on his oh, back. Yeah. But, um, yeah, they can't they can't fly with an adult on their back until they're, like, 15, 16 years old, the dragon oh, itself. Wow. So um, the dragons that the two Targaryens have had since birth? Or no. before? They, okay. had, they, they were dragon, they're older dragons that had previous dragon riders. Got yeah. Um, yeah. Especially Caraxes, he had. A, he, I think he's had three by this. Damon is his third dragon rider. Yeah. Rhaenyra's is hatched with her, right. so shouldn't be as big as Caraxes. Yeah, yeah. Or hatched with her, or only had one rider. I don't have them all. I don't know all off the heart, but mm. we, we can look into it more if we get more dragons. Um, but yeah, there's some big dragons we're hoping to see, and some really cool little dragons as well. Oh, yeah. If they bring them all out. Mm. There's some of them are some of them are known for being really pretty. There's one called Sunfire. Uh, there's one called um, the Blue Sapphire, is its nickname. Yeah. Some really nice little dragon, and then there's like really boring ones like the Grey Ghost and the Cannibal, who we're going to see that <laughs> haven't even had riders. Interesting. But we haven't been to Dragonstone. No. The, the majority of the dragons are kept. The only dragons that are kept in the Dragon Pit, which we saw at the beginning, yeah, are dragons that. Their riders are in, are in King's Landing at the I moment. See, I the see. riderless dragons had mainly kept the dragons. Mm. Interesting. The thing that gets me, that I find most interesting about that, is because Game of Thrones gives the idea that obviously we see that kind of motherly bond between the dragons and Daenerys. Whereas, obviously, if these dragons had previous riders, does that mean anyone can ride them? Because obviously there was this whole thing about the blood of the dragon. But then surely, if there's if you can have multiple riders, you know, different riders, 
you know, does that so, not shake it up? No one ever rides a dragon that doesn't have some Valyrian blood. Right, got you. Um, there's one character called Nettles who we might see, we might not, I'm not sure if this would cast, mm. who is a bit suspicious and there's a, there's a whole series with her going after, but if we see her, we'll bring that up. But no one rides, we will see some non cadet Targaryen Valyrian riders, got you. but they are known as dragon seeds, who are bastards from Dragonstone. Ah, um, okay. So they're like the, a, a, a random Targaryen son slept with a random barmaid. They had a kid. Yeah. Um, so we will see some of them. Uh, I, I definitely that will be that's been confirmed. Um, yeah. So it's only ever there's the whole thing. We only know of dragon riders ever having one dragon. They never had a dragon die and swap dragons, which is why the series yeah. doesn't have a dragon. And. Dragons only have one rider at a time because there is points in the Targaryen history where we see someone try and ride someone else's dragon and it not go too well. Ah. So there is a bond between yeah. rider and dragon. Got ya. But the dragon can move on. Interesting. It's kind of <clears throat> like in Avatar. I was literally thinking that. Is where the, yeah. you have to pick... I forget all their flying things. Yeah. Involved, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. That's interesting. That is interesting, yeah. So we move on to your... Have you got any more questions about in the books? Anything popping in? Or should we move on to your little armour section? I guess just before we do move into the little armour section, uh, kind of on the same lines, I know that you were a big fan of like the King's Guard, the City Watch, they have the way that they looked compared yeah. to the books. Yeah. Do you want to say some more on that? Well, so I think the King's Guard look a lot better than in Game of Thrones because they actually have white enameled armour for now. Yeah. It may not be the most accurate armour in the world, mm. um, but then they are in that armour all 24-7 on guard. They're guards, not on the battlefield. Yeah. So I think there's a bit more leaning than that. I do like how they've got more of the gold cloaks as well and with the black armour on the chest. Because mm. again, in the show, they had the, they had the gold mail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the gold cloaks are always gold cloaks, black mail or black armour. Got you. Um... So that part of it's better, but it's not the most accurate with, like, some things. Just... The books are generally pretty accurate to history with armour types, to be yeah. honest. Obviously, they're not picture books, so all the all the art on it is fan art done off descriptions. <laughs> yeah. But the descriptions are good. Yeah. And, but as, we, you, as we'll pop up at certain points, there are some images of fan art done um, that is, like, pretty accurate, I think. Yeah, no, definitely. But they've, they've moved more towards the books than the show did. That's good. That's good. I mean, do you feel safe as someone who loves the books and holds them quite dearly? Do you feel safe that this is going to be a good? So far, yes. Show? There's little things that annoy me, but those <laughs> those things are like clearly some random producer went. But it seems like, especially with interviews I see with the showrunner, yeah, that he cares a lot more than Dan and Dan D and D, the guys who won Game for <sighs> Game for Yeah. Well, that's good though. That's good. Yeah. So. Along the lines of armour, obviously a big part of the episode was um, the tournament that was held for the air. So I'm going to talk a bit about um, basically medieval tournaments, medieval armour, and how kind of the show compares to it. Now obviously it is a fantasy show, and there's only so much that can be you know, similar. And at the end of the day you have to argue, well it's made up, who cares? But it's interesting, nevertheless, to kind of see how tournament actually compared. Because obviously, TV shows and movies can give some misconceptions. So, we see um, in, the, um, in, in the show that um, the tournament for the air is a week long. Now, actual medieval tournaments were, you know, a fair few weeks. So that already, we're in safe hands. Um... And there's a few interesting things. The one I thought was most interesting, and I'd be interested to see what you think about this, was this kind of mishmash of culture. Because we see a Colosseum setting with medieval knights, some in kind of more Eastern armour, some in more Western armour. It's a complete mishmash of culture. Obviously, as well, we see um, towards the end, um, kind of also like Byzantine costumes. So, I mean, what do you think about the kind of this mishmash of culture. Well, you've got to remember that in in the world that it's set in, 
Mm. It's not like the 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 Seven Kingdoms isn't the size of like England, isn't the size yeah. of France. It's a continent within itself. Mm. So we've got the Dornish, who are more Arabic inspired culture. We've got yeah. the Reach, who are more French chivalry kind of stuff. We've mm. got the Westerlings, which I would compare to the Spanish kind of culture in a rock, you know, very much Spanish terrain, a rocky, dry, yeah. arid area. We've got the Vale, which um, I would again is very chivalry esque, but more up in the hills. So maybe. Oh, yeah. Maybe a bit more like Switzerland or Southern French Alps area. Yeah. Um, we've got the Stormlands, who are seen as rough, ready, but st- still in the in the main culture of the Seven Kingdoms, which is the, se- the face of the Seven mm. um, and all of that. Um, so we've got them. But these are all our knightly cultures. And the Riverlands, who are more, I'd say the most similar to like the English or the English-held okay. land in France, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Because they suffer the most raids all the time, as you would get in the English-held land. Mm. Um, you got the Ironborn, who are like Viking reavers, don't often wear full plates of armour. Mm. They're very light, because they're on the sea all the time. you got the North, who are also Viking-esque in aspects. They don't follow the main religion of the rest of the kingdom. Got it, yeah. Um, but they're a lot more rugged. Uh, mm. So there are comparisons to make, and it is a huge... So it's basically, I would say the size of Westeros would be going from like, Northern Norway, yeah, all the way down to southern Italy, as one country. Okay, that's quite interesting. That's um, quite interesting. So yeah, so you would expect lots of cultures. Yeah, and then the Targaryens themselves are from a. They've only been in. They've mm. been in Westeros, mainland Westeros, for 130 years. Yeah, they've been on the island of Dragonstone, which was a Valerian uh, stronghold slash fortress on the edge of their empire, mm. of the Valerian Empire. Again, 200 years, if that. Yeah. And then before that, they've been very isolated on the island. Mm. Um, and then before that, they were their own empire in a similar-esque to a very loosely based on the Roman Empire. There's yeah. certain battles in their history which are very loosely based off certain <laughs> battles in the Roman Empire, especially with, like, um, the Eastern Roman Empire and fighting the Persians. They oh, kind yeah. of have the Gis, the Gisgari, the Slavers Bay, yeah. or the Persian equivalent in oh, this yeah. world. So there's equivalents, mm. very much so, to like actual cultures, but they're not 100%, and that's okay. Yeah. It's yeah. a fantasy world. But yeah, there is these different culture groups, and I do think you would have slightly different styles of armour. Yeah, no, definitely. Because it's not all about functionality, is it? No, exactly. And that's a, that's one of the interesting things. Now, obviously, uh, when kind of thinking about um, how it relates to history, one of our best um, sources is what's called the Treaties on Tournaments by uh, René d'Anjou, uh, who was a French prince in the 1460s. Now, obviously, this is quite late medieval, but it does reveal some really interesting things that we can use to talk about the episode. So the first thing as well, so we talked about, obviously, this Colosseum. How did this actually relate to the real kind of, um, I guess you could say, tournament? Well... It was unlike, it was unlikely that uh, towns or cities would have a kind of an arena coliseum in the way that we see in Game of Thrones. What would happen is, is that um, the way that Rene discusses it, a tournament would occur when a, uh, when a prince, baron, knight, whoever it was, challenged another so that would be kind of your main event. But then around that, anyone would be able to participate in jousting, archery, uh, bow hurt, um, and all various different um, types of events. They would then both agree on a town and place to erect a stadium. Now, these would have been made of wood. Um, so that's where we kind of see a big difference. But, so going back to kind of how they came about, so it was very, very much so honour-based. You would have, um, like I say, a duke um, send a, uh, who was known as the King of Arms, would send a tawny sword to another duke, um, saying, I uh, challenge you to, say, a joust or a fight or whatever it may be. He would then have to decide whether he would want to uh, accept or not. If he doesn't accept, then... Um, Rene says about that he must say um, that he, there are people far more honourable than he who 
should take this offer and all this um, kind of chivalric nonsense um, to kind of save honor, save face. Um, and then um, essentially, if they then, if he did accept, then he would take the sword and they would then uh, proceed to the next stage, which was to elect um, judges. So that's something that we don't see in the show. Obviously, we see the king watching and there's kind of the stadium of kind of the royals. So would you not get tournaments to celebrate? As they call it day day in the show. Yeah. Birthdays or you would. You, you would, by all means. But obviously, at the heart of it, it is a competition. So, and that's something that I guess that you maybe don't really get from the episode, which is that, um, that obviously people are coming to fight for prizes and um and so there were judges now what would happen is is that the people involved the um i guess the two people the two main people would choose uh, would each choose two judges each and they could be knights or squires um and essentially what would happen is is that once those people were chosen um their their herald uh, heraldic coats of arms would be painted and placed in all four corners of the arena so what would then happen is that then the person who's hosting would then give a grand speech now we do see the king do that which again very accurate so um in the treaties of the tournament it says an example of a speech and it's very similar to the one given in the show it's you know all about kind of propaganda yeah essentially um and but unlike the show um tournaments were bound up in certain rules and regulations you couldn't just wear whatever and do whatever and you know use whatever there were certain tricks and regulations and rules and restrictions that had to be met now the reason for this which again is something that is kind of a misconception in in media is that it was all about safety at the end of the day no one no one's gonna die uh, which obviously in the show you see people dragging each other off of horses and yeah. you know taking an axe to their face. You know this again. This plays into this whole you know Arthurian kind of fantasy of you know we're here to woo the ladies, show our strength and prowess, and be very honourable. So at the end of the day, we don't want to die. So what was it? So I've got my actual armour because. Um, <clears throat> I'm part of Bohurt, which is um, kind of a modern <clears throat> adaption of these kind of medieval um, tournaments. And actually, the treaties of uh, René d'Anjou is kind of what um, helped, I guess, kind of set the actual rules. So, my armour is fairly accurate to what would have actually been used, apart from a few things. So, essentially, the main thing is is that you would wear, as I'm wearing now, a kind of under tunic kind of top. And on top of that would be your gambeson. Now, I've got my gambeson here. Um, if I just oh, bring it here. So this is your undercoat, essentially, that your armor goes on top of. Um, it is quite thick, very padded. But this is the thing. I mean, if you feel that, what would you say that is? Maybe a centimeter at most? Yeah. Now, in the treaties of the tournament... Um, Rene writes that your gambeson had to be three fingers thick, which when you think of that thickness compared to this, I mean, Jesus Christ. But obviously <laughs> on horseback, a lot more force is going through. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, and, and kind of, again, it plays into that whole idea of safety. Um, so again, yeah, so your gambeson has to be three fingers um, thick. And um, then um, your helmet had to be either a bassinet or a cape line which is kind of like your wolf rib now we do actually see in the show damon um does a joust against who is Kristen it? cole he has what's called a pig helmet so you it's kind of got that um the small slits and this kind of bulging kind of I guess you could say like a semicircle that has a lot of holes in that's called a pig helmet that's a bassinet so actually that's very accurate to kind of what would have been used now i also have a different type of bassinet um which i will show just here uh, essentially this is somewhat similar 
to um, what you would see many others wearing. Um, essentially, you have um, the breathable holes, so you also see that in the pit helm, you'll see that in the actual episode itself, and you have small eye slits. Now, Damon himself doesn't have a visor, which... I think that's to do with his character a little bit. That's, a, that's fair, but... I think that's to do with his, like, like re recklessness to a certain extent. And I think it just shows that. I guess it's all also about, like, your kind of courage and bravery that it's like, I don't need a visor. Yeah. That's how, you know... And he's meant to be one of the best warriors in the realm at the moment. Which is fair enough. But if it was a real tournament, that wouldn't be up to regulation. But, <laughs> just as equally, could he not say, book of those regulations, I'm the prince of the realm. Ah, but this is the thing, is that, again, it's all down to this idea of honour and chivalry. It was, you know, you're not going there to... You're going there to prove yourself, but you're not necessarily going there to, to be to be an asshole. So that, that reminds you know? me of another thing in Togo in history. Mm, go they have it. a thing called the rule of exceptionalism. That the Togarians are one above everyone else. That's why they're allowed to have incest. Yeah. No one else is. And they actually got it written to their into their religious roles that they were different, they were better. In the show, they say that they're closer to gods than yes. humans. Yeah. So, like, it, it would be a thing if you were in a later book, which we uh, in the town of Dunk and Egg, mm. uh, our main character Dunk punches a prince. Why? Right. He's threatened just for punching the prince to lose his arm. They were going to cut his arm off. Yeah. So they were like, uh, so he punched a prince once, kicked him once, and knocked out a few of his teeth. So as a punishment, if he was, uh, if he didn't end up. Things changed, obviously, in the book, but his punishment mm. originally was to lose his leg, lose his arm, wow. both the ones that kid it, <laughs> and lose his teeth. Bloody hell. Because see they are seen as different. Yeah. That's interesting, and that's something that I guess you don't really see uh, in this, primarily because the majority of people joining tournaments were knights, barons, kind of... Everyone else we saw was. Were yeah, yeah. Lower, lower knight, lower, no, lower yeah. ability being knighthood, going all the way up to the prominent realm, nobles of the realm, the mm. Baratheons, the Tyrells. Yeah, yeah. The I Tyrells. mean, obviously, most famously, the Black Prince was a keen uh, tournament um, goer, as was actually as well, I believe, Henry VIII. Um, Henry VIII, yes, was definitely yeah. keen. Um, but that kind of, but again, they all kept with this kind of honour and, and chivalric I do thing. think there is, especially with Henry VIII and the Black Prince, yeah, there is yeah. little things where, like, they bent the rules for him. Yeah, I mean, quite possibly. Or um, people would, like, cow their louts a bit. Yeah. Like, oh, is, yeah, There yeah. is definitely... They do bend, not to as big an example in the show. No, yeah, definitely. But they do bend the rules. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, but even in the show, compared to the book, the tournament is a lot more chaotic than they do are in the books. They have yeah. they have different formats of tournaments in the book. Tournaments mm. in the books. They've got the classic, like pyramid kind of thing where like yeah. it might knock out rounds until there's one person left, got or yeah. they have um, five champions, and um, like there's five champions and you choose one of the champions to go for, and the five champions left after the end of the week or the two weeks. Yeah, other way are there so you start with five champions and then once you win you become a champion until someone knocks you off your seat that's interesting um, yeah as well as there being certain traditions like you don't have a melee at a wedding that's mm. the thing in the books so like one of our characters wants to go is a hedge knight wants to go to a melee because he's better in the melee than he is in the joust mm. and they go who would have a melee at a wedding yeah um let's see there's cert there is certain taboos also set up in the cultural of this world mm. as well um that are, are slightly different. Yeah. That aren't as mentioned as much in the show, I think. That's interesting. I'll get back to that about kind of the knockout stuff. Because that's, that's something that's almost actually quite similar. But if I go back to one of my potential qualms um, about the show. Was uh, when we get to the understanding of, again, protection. Now, one of the problems I've always had with my um, helmet is the fact is gaps. Now... Again, this is always an issue, is gaps. Now, obviously, on my helmet, where this comes forwards, you can kind of see that underneath here, there's a gap that leads straight to my kind of chin slash neck. 
um, this is very uh, tricky to overcome. And one of the things that I see in the episode, time and time again, especially in the tournament, is these massive gaps around the neck where there's no aventail. So that's what... Um, it's more annoying because they do it for some of them, but not for others. Somewhat, yeah. <laughs> but there's just... It's not even like... It's like you can see skin. It's not even that there's like a hood or anything. It's like just pure skin. It's like you're, you're asking to be beheaded. None of them have an aventail. Now, this is something that was really prominent um, in kind of the medieval era, was to connect your helmet to some chain mail or to some plates through an avatel, which is kind of a cloth hood that would be connected. And this protects your neck. So I've got on the back here to protect my neck um, a piece of, of plate. Um, there's, um, I know that some people also underneath the chainmail also have plated armour as well to protect it. Another way that you can protect it is through what's known as a gorget. Ooh. A gorget, which I also have, is um, a plate. So these are pauldrons that to protect your shoulders. And underneath here is um, plated armour. Uh, this is actually titanium, which is not too accurate. No. But it's cheaper. <laughs> but the problem actually with titanium is that it's very flexible, which is why people getting into the sport will often get titanium because it's cheaper, but actually it can cause more injuries. In any case, if I put this over me just quickly, whoop, you can see that it comes up to uh, cover my neck, essentially. Now, this um, gorge is actually fairly basic, but there are some people um, in the sport that have uh, steel gorgets that really go really high, that really come up to protect your neck. Because again, at the end of the day, you don't want to be beheaded. If you were doing jousting or the melee and you had, you know, something goes wrong, your neck is where, you know, your main, you've got some main arteries there. Um, so by having a combination of the chainmail over the top plus the gorget, that's how you can protect yourself. But in the show, hardly any of them have uh, have gorgets or um, aventails, which is something that, again, if this was a real medieval tournament, it would not be allowed. I do think, though, Go we are going to see a change in some of the armour. Do you think? I think this is a pilot episode. Yeah. Yes, some of it was refilmed, but it was... Uh, a lot lower budget than the later episodes would be. Because mm. this episode came out a few months before the rest of the stuff was filmed. Got yeah. Not for us, but like for people to view. Yeah. So I do think we, we, we will see a refinement. So the order. budget will include Gorgé's. <laughs> I do. Well, we saw, <laughs> as we saw with Chris and Cole, he was on main, beside David on main target. And, yeah. and, the, and the Baratheon. Yeah. He had good armour. He did, he did. And they were our main characters. Mm. It was more the little side ones that you literally, you did only see them for like 10 yeah, seconds. Yeah, no, of course, of course. Um, and I do think as we get more main characters in, we are going to see yeah. better armor. I am being overly picky just because, but the topic of gaps is one that's, especially in tournaments, but even just in armor in general, is like so important. Because, Especially with these rich of the rich people. Yeah, because they that's... They can afford to not yeah, have the gaps. Because at the end of the day, when you've got steel hitting steel, it's it's the gaps that's where you're going to be able to defeat your opponent. Um, and so by having these massive gaps along the arms, that's where you typically have them. Um, and again, on the neck, you're just asking for it. But is there not a certain level of mobility to... Is there not examples of, like, five peasants charging down a knight in, like, a full set of armour and knocking him to the ground? I mean, I guess, because obviously the... I, I mean, that's what, again, another misconception that we see in media is when you see, like, knights and just someone will, like, take a sword and just slash them and they'll die. More so, when knights fought, it was about getting them to the ground... Grappling to them to the ground and right then... Right to the throat or right to the eye. Exactly. Through the eye hole, or in the neck or wherever. Or kill them. Yeah. Hold it there and... Well, that's the thing, because obviously at some point we see that actually it's quite useful and almost in the same way, like, like almost like a G Geneva Convention, that actually you wouldn't kill nobility, uh, aristocracy, because of how valuable they were, yeah. whether for information, whether for money, you know, ransoming. So actually, the whole idea to get to defeat a knight was really just to get him on the floor because, w like a turtle on their back, 
once you're on the floor in full armor, it's very I, and you're exhausted. I also think later on, as history carried on, mm. ransom them started even happening with non nobility. Yeah, no, definitely. I know it definitely happened with mercenary troops to a certain extent. Yeah, I can imagine so. Anyone of relative importance. Or men at arms instead of just pure men. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would have definitely have been. uh, Not every time. Yeah, yeah. But sometimes they were definitely ransomed. No, definitely. So we've covered. You've got your gambeson that's three fingers thick. You've got your bassinet, uh, as we've seen. You would have an Aventail or Gaucher, which obviously we don't see in the show, but. Never mind we that. We don't see some. We don't see others. Okay. <laughs> but what we do see in the show that's also very accurate is a uh, another condition, which essentially is that your van braces and uh, uh, rear braces are put together. So if I grab mine, a lot of people, a lot of a lot of people, when they have their arm piece, will have three separate. Um, pieces. Now mine are all attached uh, through leather on the inside, which means that you only have one arming point. So that's where it attaches to your gambeson. So it means that you can just slide your arm in, and uh, it's all it's all on fine and easily. And it also reduces again gaps. Now we also see um, we do see in the show a lot of them having one piece um band braces one piece arm uh, armor uh which again is a very good um and accurate um it's the ease of aspect. arming though isn't it as well oh definitely because like i say you know i know some people who have got various different pieces you've got you know an arming point here for your um braces you've got an arming point for your elbow you've got an arming point and all of that needs to be tied and it just also increases the chance of armor failure uh, because obviously if someone hacks it off and it falls off, then you're out. Um, so by having it all in one, it increases safety, increases protection, and makes it a lot easier um, to hide those gaps, which of course is again the whole point. So quickly just going back to the helmet, uh, if I just grab that, one thing we do see, which actually is one thing that is, I suppose, quite good about uh Damon's helmet um, is that so on his helmet he has like these dragon wings, doesn't he? So actually, in the um, rules and regulations, we see that you're allowed what's called mantling, um, mantling. So that's where you're allowed um, to have things coming off of your helmet that signify who you are. Now, one of the most um, common ways which you see is almost like a, you know, like. Almost like a rope around the top, like a cloth, like I don't know how to describe it, but like a like a like a rope going round that's coloured, yeah. and then sometimes you have like a bit of cloth coming down. Um, you typically see it. It was actually used most prominently in the Crusades to actually cool down helmets because what they would do is they would soak these uh, mandolins in water, put it on the helmet, and it would cool down the metal and cool down your head. Um, but obviously, what you can do is obviously have your own colours. Uh, whichever you may choose, um, and you, you can have your coat of arms obviously on the cloth bit that comes down itself. So we actually see in, in his helmet um, these kind of yeah, it's kind of like a horse hair yeah backing with the with the black which and was red. which was allowed, uh, and you could have that obviously if you could afford it. Would you ever see in a similar thing you saw the the high tower knight with like a a tower on top or yeah that's an interesting uh, it's often one the culture where people have like whole lions or birds or... yeah i'll show a photo but you do see um i think antlers is quite a common one coming off um so you do see yeah depictions of various different things for more ornate pieces of armor um and yeah you're fully allowed it now the one the particular one about the the helmet that's in kind of the shape of the tower. That's quite an interesting one that I'm not overly too sure about. Um, you do have armor that's got, say, brass pieces that kind of depict, you know, like a maybe like a cross or whatever it may be. Um, but having it in kind of the shape of a tower itself, not so sure. Um, that is, that hereditary is a tower. Yeah, no, that would yeah. make sense. I guess if you could, 
you know, I'm guessing it was. It didn't look like it was made part of the helmet. Look like it was more of a. Yeah, a, I mean, if it, yeah, like a plaster I mean, cast on top yeah. or something. But yeah, like I, I, I can't remember where this is from. Like, maybe from the books at some point, or maybe from something else I read in history. It may just be something from random culture, <laughs> where um, there's a tournament going on, and uh, uh, this this professional tourney night is really mm. good, um, but chooses to lose because he bets on it. Okay. Uh, to annoy one of the more like hincy bincy noble ones who isn't that good but very wealthy. Yeah. He knocks his uh, his mantle off on Interesting. purpose. Interesting. When it went on, he he aims for it and knocks it off on purpose. That I can see is as being quite a cheeky kind of because again that's such that's your oh, heraldic. You know that's your kind of symbol. That Could you see it to identify you? Yeah. I could definitely see that being a thing to kind of to yeah undermine your opponent almost yeah that's it that's quite interesting now another way obviously you could identify yourself is through a what's called a tabard so this is my uh, tabard which identifies me and my team um these are our colors and it's quite dirty and uh, ridden with blood and sand but essentially this goes on top of your armour and it serves two purposes. One is that it can hide your gaps, which again means that your opponent has to work a bit harder because you, rather than them being able to see where's the best places to attack you, a tabard covers that and makes it a lot more difficult. What it also does, again, it's kind of with this, you know, with the mantling and the, and the helmet extensions, is allows you to, again, identify yourself um, amongst other knights um so so we've done the armor uh oh moving on to like the legs uh in t what it's oh, pretty good i thought from the legs. yeah the legs actually um what you see again with the opponent of uh daemon is that the kind of curious skirt oh that's right i was going to talk about that you can either have a brigadine which is what i've got or a curious now essentially that the the difference there is whether it's a single plate um which is kind of your later medieval or multiple plates which is what i've got um which looks where is it uh something along the lines of i don't know where it's gone well it's well, plated anyway just show the entire I'm... of that it looks somewhat without the black paddle. Yeah, I mean, it looks somewhat similar to the gorget. Essentially, it has a f studded uh, kind of cloth covering. Uh, it then has underneath it a series of plates that allow it to kind of move about. So it's very good for mobility. Very good for kind of dispersing um, kind of pressure and kind of the power um, of attacks across um, your body. So you could have either one of those. So from below the waist, however, the rules simply state that you can pretty much wear whatever you want. So um, I have ooh, my leg piece here. This is what you may see. Um, again, it's got various plates to allow that movability. A lot of people think that, um, again, another misconception is that armour was extremely restrictive, that you would like kind of waddle around but actually you can run you can jump you can do whatever you want in it really um and essentially the rules govern that whatever you would wear for battle is whatever you would wear in the tournament in terms of your legs i do think you would get as we saw in the show a little bit legs that were more focused on the armor on the front than the side necessarily yeah you more focused on let, pretty much no armor on the back of your leg yeah no of course and i actually have a leg piece because we also didn't see them wear the little booties, did we? Yeah. They weren't wearing armoured feet. Were they not? No. So. Oh Christ. Here we go. I actually have... <laughs> I've now found my brig. So this is a brigadine, as we can see. So you've got various straps on the side that allow you to do it up. There's a, a bit on the back. But if I switch it round... You can kind of see 
all the different plates that allow it to move quite easily um, and kind of again absorb those hits you've got multiple plates again on the rather than the top to protect uh, the back of your neck and kind of your, your upper chest so that's kind of um, one way to have it another way would kind of be it would look quite similar but this piece here would all be one or sheet you do get somewhere with like one sheet there one sheet there yeah right? yeah yeah less seg segmented and you can get more segmented as yours as well yes no true yeah you yeah you can get it's very that's a very like eastern i find a uh, very eastern armor where you have a lot of small uh pieces of plate that's then kind of tied together or moved together is allows for again that great movability so back to the uh legs so that was the kind of your, the top of the leg this is kind of for your shin these are your shin pads and again, as we see, is that the back of your leg is relatively uncovered. Um, again, this is for uh, maneuverability. But if you're in a joust, obviously your opponent's coming head on. So it's really unnecessary to have any more armor than you necessarily need. Yeah. Uh, there are other pieces of armor that will have an extension that can fold around the back. Um, but again, the majority of armour will um, quite simply have a gap at the back. I wonder in Joust whether they sometimes even neglect wearing the armour on their back. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, quite possibly. Um, I guess the only thing is, is that obviously... The like, fall. W yeah, true, the fall. But would, um, would armour help with a fall? I... You're still hitting the same amount of force hitting the ground, aren't you, really? I would say... It may it, even focus it yeah. in some areas. I mean, I would say in personal experience that it does, that, it, that the plate and the gambeson in combination kind of does pad you a bit when you go to the ground. You can't feel it as much, that impact. Because we saw a couple of big falls, didn't we? Yeah, no, of course. Um, yeah, I reckon... I reckon so, but obviously with the Brigadine, you've, it's a two-piece anyways, otherwise what would you kind of tie it onto? And then with the Curious as well, that's very much so, uh, again, almost like a one-piece that you kind of fit into, um, or a two-piece that, again, connects to the back. Um, but then you have, um, after your legs, you then have what's called Sabatons. Which no one was wearing these in the show. Now, the reason for that is that Sabatons are used primarily in melee to protect your feet from pole arms. Um, and kind of anyone stepping on them, which obviously is something that you don't get in um, jousting. In jousting, your feet go into the stirrups, you need a lot of control. Even though we do then see a melee after that joust. Yeah. But this isn't that but, melee was planned. No, true, yeah. But the idea is, is that anyways, you wear these sabatons um, to protect your feet from um, blows coming down to essentially stop you from breaking your foot essentially um and yeah they're quite effective in doing so so that's kind of your head to toe of armor but what about weapons now i have uh here a sword and shield oh you're gonna complain about the uh the morning star yeah the the mace so oh here we go so firstly, the sword. Now, this is a what's called an arming sword. So they're a lot lighter um, than um, swords used in battle um, and also um, a lot less sharp. We can see here a rounded edge. Um, in Boha, um, it has to be as round as a coin. Um, and that was kind of very similar to back in the day. Essentially, no sharp edges, very blunt, and also quite different to actually what this would have looked like because the treaties states that your sword must be four fingers wide so this is only right with that. Two. two so double the width of this and it must be uh it must not penetrate the eye holes of a visor um, and thus must be as wide as one finger. Now, obviously, this is barely half, barely a quarter even of a finger. Surely some people must bend their all strings then as well. Maybe. Little, little bits of bribes here and there thing. Or... Yeah. 
But again, that comes back down to safety. Now, I'll put a picture on, but essentially these swords, these torn tournament swords, were almost rectangular because they couldn't have a pointed edge, so they kind of come up and then across. They were extremely thick. We're, I mean, you know, we're talking about, you know, a good few centimetres thick, obviously a few, fair few inches wide, incredibly heavy. But again, this whole idea was to protect you and protect who you're fighting. The alternate was a mace. Now, we see in the show a mace... Um, it's a ball on the chain. Which is a ball in the chain mace. Now, those um, did exist. We do have them in manuscripts and we have examples of them. But there's kind of a misconception that they were, like, amazing. <laughs> but they were only used very shortly uh, in terms of, like, other weapons. The main reason is, is because unlike a mace where you'll have kind of a long stick with a mace on the top, um, these ones were very difficult to use. You had to, obviously, you had to swing, you had to kind of build momentum, and... I think they were originally started off a medieval weapon, uh, a peasant weapon, weren't they? Yeah, I mean, you the, see the that quite a lot, yeah. With a chain and a bit of wood, which they used for thrashing wheat. Yeah. Was then used as a weapon, and then that's yeah. they moved over. I mean, that's where you get a lot of... Um, weapons come from because obviously peasants weren't necessarily allowed to have weapons and so they were able to almost disguise weapons as equipment or equipment became weapons or, or that yeah so that's why a lot more inventive i think yeah that's why you see i guess like scythes and stuff like that being used um yeah so they were they effective not really because again you can't you can't stab you can't it's it's very long range combat and it's very easy to kind of break the distance yeah to go against because as soon as it loses its momentum yeah they don't even have the benefits of like another long range weapon a spear yeah spears are quick easy easy to make easy to equip that's why spears are such a useful thing and also what you find as well in certain manuscripts that talk about it is that you end up just actually hitting yourself with the little stick (laughs) <laughs> you know as you're as you're trying to pull it back that's so, just so know. so there's one thing is also quite similar is that damon is using his normal sword yeah he's using a valyrian steel sword which in this world is incredibly sharp incredibly light yeah and basically they say can slice through normal steel if captured incorrectly wow um and he's he's using that so he's using dark sister mm. And then we also do see um, Blackfire when he's on the yeah. throne. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think of those two swords? You don't. You see less of Dark yeah. Sister, but you do see a good view of, of Blackfire. I mean, the swords it's a very, go... It's a very pointy... It is a very pointy sword, which you do see. You do see swords that have very um, thick bases by the crossguard that then go down to, like, a single point. Um, you, it had, you know, a very wide crossguard. Again, something that we see all the time. This is a very... Um, Almost Viking esque sword, very short, um, very what? short cross guard, very big um, pommel, um, which you kind of once you get into the later Middle Ages, kind of. One thing yeah. I think we'll see with Dark Sister and um, Blackfire is they are very, they're very meaningful swords. Yeah, they they mean a lot to the Hungarians, and they 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 are kind mm. of a, a symbol of authority within their family. Yeah. Um, so they are very decorated. They're obviously named, which mm. is a big thing with named swords, especially in Norse yeah. culture. Named swords were a massive thing. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure how much it carried on to medieval. Yeah, no, it did. It definitely did. Um, yeah. But we will show you some pictures of the, of the swords according to their descriptions in the book. The show is pretty accurate with them. There's one thing I'm not sure if you noticed with, okay. um, with Blackfire is that the blade kind of goes like, like starts like here mm. and goes, doop. And then yeah, it goes on. down a bit. Now, that's an interesting thing because obviously... You know, the base is where you you kind of your strength is. Um, so to come out and then go in, that would almost make a weak point here. When if you think about it, so when you're hitting, you know, when you're hitting here, you know, the force exerting on this part here, this is where your strongest bit needs to be. So the way that it then comes in, but again, you know, that still supposedly has different properties no exactly yeah 
But I, I, you do. I think it, it is a fantasy. Mm. It is a fantasy no, yeah. show. So you do accept certain things. May just be slightly different. Yeah, it's no, like exactly. we don't really see an evolution in the Game of Thrones world because there's this whole thing with uh, dragons halting their technological advancement because mm. dragons just overpower everything. Yeah, no, exactly. Is that is there anything else you'd like to talk about armor or weapons? I would like to talk about the shield because oh, the there's shield another there's another misconception, which is that shields were almost flimsy as hell, made almost made of balsa wood. Um, we Which see that it... shield would have definitely been made on the shield. <laughs> yeah. So we, I have a, here a shield. This is quite a large shield. Kind of a, you know, a bit larger than most, but um, somewhat um, accurate anyways. Now, you had very different types of shields. Now, in um, medieval tournaments, shields like this would have been a bit smaller, and they would have been called punch shields. Um, and basically, they allow you to punch your opponent. So usually they were in kind of this shape, um, where you would hold the evolution it. from the kite shield, wasn't it? Exactly. But you would hold the kite. Um, you know, we typically think you'd hold it like this way, and you'd put your arm kind of like that. Um, whereas actually, for a punch shield, you would have it this way, and you would have your arm across. That way that you can actually then punch with this part of the um, shield. So, that, um, you know, is interesting anyways. But, I mean, this shield here, and, and, you know, it's a decent shield, but it's a good, it's a good thickness. Now, there's a fair few scrapes and um, cuts on this, and I've taken many a pole arm on it. Never have I ever seen a shield break in one... Combat. Like one lot of combat. Uh, yeah. I'm and... sure over time. Oh yeah, over time by all means. But then you'd stop using it with the unsafe. Yeah. But you could you could hit this with my sword as hard as you wanted, and it will not smash in the way that we see it in the show. And that's quite a big misconception that you know, whether it be someone hitting it with a mace or a pole arm or whatever it may be, um, that they just obliterate. That, that doesn't happen. You know, these are reinforced. Um, they are, you know, tightly packed together. So what, what are the layers of your shield then? What's this top layer you've got? It seems like a, a canvasy. Yeah, it's kind of, this is, so this is obviously to be able to paint it. Yeah. Um, this is obviously something that a lot of people would have because, again, it's another way to identify yourself. Um, this symbol here actually means protection and defense, um, but I'm looking to change it. So if anyone's got any ideas, please send them in. Um, but essentially it is again, yeah, like a, a canvas, um, that's put across almost like, like a, what you would find on a, on like an art canvas yeah. that's stretched across and that's kind of clamped down using the bits around the edge, which are kind of this kind of rubbery, um, seal that's then... Would it have been leather? Through. Uh, yeah, it would. It, yeah. I mean, this is actually probably leather. I say it's rubber, but this is kind of almost like a... No, it's not leather, but... All right. <laughs> <laughs> and then you would have you know a good strong wood now what that wood would what that wood would be i've got a little, <laughs> I've got a little poem for you go on go on so this is a, this is a poem in the book oh yeah oak and i and guard me well or else i'm dead and doomed to hell well there you go which is a shield rhyme as they call it in the book well i mean i'd be interesting to know actually i'd have to look it up but um because would you get ever there's a big thing with like having iron rimmed shields or I obviously these would be iron. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely, uh, you know, definitely that you would have, especially in in war, you'd want, you know, to do more damage. And so by having iron rather than leather around the edges, obviously that does a lot more. Um, <clears throat> and it's, you know, in terms of protection as well, it's it's a lot better. Um, but yeah, so I reckon because I can see there's a bit of wood poking through. So I actually, this is it is quite hard wood, but. Again, like I say, I've taken many, many blows. There's many scrapes and scratches on this, but I, never have I ever seen one obliterate. I do know a thing they, they, they did with some shield manufacturer. I'm not sure in what period. I know the Romans definitely did it in the medieval period it, as yeah. well, where they would have multiple layers of wood facing yes. different directions. Yeah. So if there was a weakness, say, like, because wood has weakness in it, you follow the, the, the grain of the wood. Mm. If there was a grain going this way, there's another one just below it going that way, oh, and yeah. another one just below it going that way, another one going that way. I, so you yeah. split your grain so that it'll never 
even if it happened a little bit at the top, like it may look like be happening a little bit here, it would never go all the way through. Yeah, no, definitely. I would definitely agree with that, and that's probably... Because anyone that knows woodwork will know that you follow the grain <coughs> of the wood when you're doing this. No, of course, yeah. So that's, that's that. Now, you said earlier about um, the tournaments about... Oh, that was it, the knockout. So actually, another thing that um, that's in the treaties is about the prizes because at the end of the day it is a competition now what's really interesting is is that it kind of is quite similar to what you were saying so there are three prizes that would be given for um jousting so you would get a gold rod so this is your third place to whomever strikes the best lance blow so not necessarily who wins but like it's almost like your golden boot in football like whoever plays the best man of the match exactly yeah uh then it's kind of like it's an interesting, like, another prize, because almost I would say it's a bit of a meme, this one. Because you get a ruby for whoever breaks the most lances. So you almost get aw awarded for being a bit rubbish. So, a similar thing in football. In my football club, it's called the Donkey. The worst person in the game is called the Donkey. So. There you go. And then, of course, then you have your top prize, which is uh, whoever lasts the longest in the list. So whoever, ultimately, in the Wins. knockouts whoever wins so there's some serious money going into these and these were you know widespread across england france uh the hre you know spain iberia and uh yeah they were widely widely popular so there you go there's kind of some there's there's definitely some really strong similarities we but also some very strong differences we don't see the winner in the show yeah but that may be because the, the the queen just died true now there is <laughs> there is a tournament in game of thrones yes um with robert raffian back in season one yes. that's i would argue a lot more accurate to what a real uh medieval tournament would look like you have those wooden kind of scaffolds you have um you know i mean in this is it, one is you... it, but is it is it out of the realms of possibility for a king to build an arena rest no i guess i guess but i mean the, the definitely I guess in in capital cities I mean obviously we have coliseums that still exist and everything that we use um, but as far as I'm aware in terms of once you get to a kind of lower down you know you kind of your barons your lords dukes but yeah, they this was, wouldn't this was, this was a king's tournament no exactly true yeah so you would you would have Especially Most them probably being yeah, inspired arena. by the Byzantines. It, it did make me think, especially with the horses not stopping and running around, the, a yeah. bit of the chariot races. No, definitely. I mean, that's a very strong, you know, um, thing. It's actually, research has shown that the highest paid athlete in history was a chariot racer from the Byzantine Empire. And, um, yeah, definitely. It was, it was extremely fast paced, which does ring true to chariots. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. Right. So we moved on to our last section of the podcast. The last section. We've been going for an hour and 20. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Longer than we expected. Uh, character of the week. This has only been a few minutes. So the series, yeah, current king of the of the seven kingdoms at this point in uh, time. He's uh, he's currently only got one living child, which is near his one living sibling, which is Damien. His wife just died in the show, Emma Aaron, who is also his cousin. Uh, he's the grandson of the last king. His father died in battle on Daemon's dragon, uh, Caraxes. His father, Daemon, actually rode that before him. Oh. That's popped him. His mother died in childbirth. His mother was a very athletic, outgoing woman for the time in, in, this, in this book. Mm. She basically, there's this whole thing with Balon, show, oh, no, the oldest one was Aemon, I just remember now. Aemon was born, and Balon's the second son, and Balon followed Aemon around everywhere. Got you. And, um, and then their they're, they're fourth child, but they're, they're like after these, but they're, they're their second daughter, mm. um, who was Viserys' mother, then followed Balon around everywhere, then they were shown to marry, and she was a very w willful, outgoing, bubbly person. And so was his father. His father was a great warrior. He was Hand of the King for ten years, Master of Coin, very prominent in the realm before before he died um and uh, then we get this series 
who is known in the book, we see it a bit in the show, but let's say for being quite weak. Interesting. So he's not indecisive. Once he's made a decision, he would stick to it, but very amenable. Like he very much wanted to make everyone happy, mm. would have conflict. He used to hate people arguing. He absolutely hated the fact his brother and his hand argued. And as we'll see later, he would hate the fact that his wife and his daughter argue. And he's always trying to make everyone happy. And the court at this time in, in the books is a very happy place. Mm. It's lots of poets, lots of music, um, lots of balls. He's not a very martial king. He's, that's why we yeah. see his brother very much take over a lot of that aspect of it. Um, and uh, he ends up being quite fat. And we, he, we do see him, he's a bit younger at this point, but like, he's gaining a bit of weight. He's quite... He's, we, you see him as a bit nerdy with his little, sta- like his little yeah. statue. So I think the character is pretty accurate. Interesting. But like, he's a bit more pathetic in the book, I think. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So that, that's our last little section of the week. So, yeah. So thank you very much for watching. See you guys next week. Hopefully a bit earlier in the week we get the next one out. Yeah. Yeah. No. Definitely. And um, thank you very much. Next week I am doing a series of interviews with um, some really brilliant historians and archaeologists. That will be out uh, in successive weeks. But aside from that, thank you very much for watching. Please do look at some previous videos and. Um, Hopefully I get renewed to come back for another Game of Thrones themed one. Listen, if it gets... What, what is it they do on YouTube? If I get 10,000 likes, if I, if then get, Ben if, comes back. If we get 25 likes, Ben comes back. Boom. Yeah, we're, we're not as high as the others. You heard it here first. <laughs> if we get more than 10 views, If you want Ben's to hear more back. of the fake history of Game of Thrones and not actual history, <laughs> I'm back. Thank you very much.